Yeah, but um, we two uh, like, sort of wondered where the connection between our papers was. Now I think I found one. <laughs> um, so I understand you that you were talking more about customary international law as a means to creating stability um, and also trying to identify criteria under which participation can be enabled. So my paper will I will try to um, highlight moments of customary international law which undermine exactly these two aspects. So um, the way I understand it, I think customary, customary international law is um, also um, a concept that undermines stability in the international system and the stability of norms. And um, it is also unable to secure the position from which subjects can participate in the creation of norms. <coughs> which I think was one of the criteria for, you know, valuable consent. Um, right, so and to do that, I, my work is considered, uh, is considering the process rather of formation. Um, and I try to understand the character of this process and the character of the practice uh, from which this process um, um, yeah, feeds. So, um, from my work, I basically have two kinds of explorations. It kind of starts from looking, from looking at the debates and the processes around uh, self-defense against non-state actors. So that's essentially the question of the legality of targeted killings and um, interventions against terrorist groups in, which are situated in other states um, and where the state where they're located hasn't consented um, to the intervention. So that's basically from looking at these processes over the past 20 or so years, that's one uh, inspiration. And the other one is theories from uh, Karl Schmidt, Walter Benjamin, um, Giorgio Agamben on the one hand, and Niklas Luhmann, who's a German jurist and sociologist um, of systems theory. So um, why I found those interesting is because they um, try to understand the relation between international law and what's outside of international law. And this will also be the major topic of my talk now. So um, I will proceed in three steps. Um, so at first, I would like to point to what I think is a gap or an absence in the doctrine of uh, custom international law formation and also in the concept of validity of international law. Um, and then once we have this gap established, I will um, try to look at what, what we can learn from this gap, what it teaches us. So that's the theory part. And I employ two perspectives, one from the inside, kind of looking at how an international law understands um, what it's doing, and then an external perspective, looking at how we, looking at the processes of international law kind of from the outside, can uh, understand what's happening there. Yeah, the third part will be um, conclusions. Right, so um, to start with the gap, um, so the gap is essentially um, situated between how customary, customary international law is being created in reality and how the doctrine of customary international law formation and the idea of validity in international law formulate these, um, these um, processes. So um, I, I'm just supposing these two kinds of um, two sets of norms here, they're essentially secondary norms on the left hand and primary norms on the right hand in Hartian terms, right? So on the left hand, we have doctrine of custom international law formation. It essentially tells us under what circumstances can we assume that there is a norm of custom international law. It says that it has to be state practice and uh, that has to be accompanied by being a jurist, right? So there are, of course, many different varieties of this, but I think that's not so important here. Then on the right side, we have the like, material rights and obligations of states, which are inferred from this uh, CIL <coughs> doctrine, right? So for example, in my example, the um, prohibition on the use of force. Here I've written Article 4 in the Charter of Force Treaty, but um, curiously, uh, much of the debate about this treaty is happening sort of in customary international law terms. Or also, um, in terms of territorial sovereignty, which is taken as a more custom international law. So, um, 
if we look now at the relation of these two concepts, we can see that um, this left side tells us when we have a norm on the right side. But then there is still a third actor, which is not mentioned here in the game, and that is the norm which is in place until the norm on the right side gets established. So the idea is that there is a process of customary international law formation. Um, it's covered by the doctrine of customary international law, and it results into a new norm of customary international law. That is how international law looks at it. Um, but it doesn't tell us anything about the relation this process has to the norms which are enforced before the change happens, right? And of course, everyone who studies custom international law knows of the so-called paradox, that's the practice which constitutes a change in custom international law will have to be in violation of the material norms enforced at the time, in the beginning, right? So um, in my example, um, we can see that we have, for example, targeted killings in different states in North Africa and Afghanistan, um, Pakistan, uh, Syria, and so forth. And there is a provision on the use of force. And the question now is is there sufficient state practice so that um, the um, law has adapted to this practice? But since this takes a certain amount of time, um, everyone would acknowledge that the practice at first is in violation of the um, provision on the use of force until that change actually happens. Um, so, but this aspect is absent in these doctrines of custom international law and in the concept of validity to which I'm turning now. So, the validity, the concept of validity says basically only that a norm is part of international law, that it is really the norm, right? And it says that if it is part of international law, you have to obey it. And this concept of validity, it doesn't say us anything about the process of customary international law formation. But if we read these two concepts together, we can actually see that uh, this doctrine of validity gets relativized, right? Because now we have two concepts with which we evaluate state practice. We have on the one hand the material norm, which is considered valid, right? It's the provision on the use of force in this example. It's saying uh, you cannot bomb on a foreign territory unless that state has consented. Right? So that is considered a valid norm until there is sufficient state state practice. But at the same time, we have the doctrine of customary international law formation, which, and now we're kind of getting to speech act theory, which may not say that you're allowed to create customary international law, but it says that you can create customary international law through changing, uh, through violating the prohibition on the use of force. So it amounts to a kind of paradoxical statement if we read this to, uh, together. So international law is actually saying you can change customary international law through its violation, but you are not allowed to do it. Right? So um, in reality, I think this works much different. I think customary international law is formation is accepted as a, well, so to speak, legitimate means of creating international legal rules. So um, this is kind of where the gap lies, that it's customary, like the doctrine of customary international law formation says one thing, but it actually means something else. It says you can change the international law, but it, what it actually means is you're allowed to change international law. And that means you are allowed to violate the norms of international law. And that's, of course, the paradox within the um, uh, concept of validity. Because validity says you cannot violate the norm. You have to obey the norm. Right? So um, from this first part, I think we can already formulate three conclusions. Um, first conclusion is um, that customary international law formation is a process, a procedure, I may even say, which actually is really not regulated. So, because we are always looking at this doctrine of custom international law formation, we kind of think that it's a process that is under the guidance of international law, but because it's utterly like, unrelated to the material norms which are enforced at the time where it's happening, it's actually unregulated, because the states are allowed to detach themselves from the material norms of international law. So in the second conclusion, um, 
is that the validity of custom international law has sort of an implicit, non-mentioned, but also unlimited um, reservation. It has an exception to it. It says you have to obey the norms unless you want to create new customary international law. Um, and this is problematic in two ways, I think, because on the one hand, there are, well, it's actually the same way, uh, because there are no criteria in international law as to when one state would be allowed to change customary international law. So international law actually takes an almost no control over this process of formation, um, except that it says you have to do it with the intention or with the, you know, I now say intention, I know it's not conform with the classical formulation of opinion viewers, but you have to do it in the process of creating a new norm. That's the only qualification. Right? So that third conclusion is that um, we can call, we can say that this consists of the suspension of international law in the process of custom international law formation. Okay, um, so far this gap part, and now I'm going to talk in the last four minutes a bit about how we can understand this gap theoretically. Right? Um, and so I'll at first employ this kind of inside perspective. Um, that means I will try to understand what international law thinks it's doing there. What, how does international law understand what is going on there? So, and um, what I would say is that international law presumes that there is sort of a non-legal sphere to which states can resort to form customary international law. So that's a sort of sphere where there are simply no legal norms at all. And just for the sake of this presentation, I will call this um, a state of nature, because that's what traditionally a state without any law is called, right? Um, so I've made this, I'm now coming up with a sort of couple of graphs like that. I hope they will be understanding. This is supposed to show what international law thinks it's doing. So it thinks that there's a state of nature and a state of law, and the um, the arrow signals transformation from the state of nature to the state of law. And this is what customary international law doctrine thinks it's doing. Things that there's an outside of international law, there's a state of nature, and there is a transformation going on from, um, from that left side to the right side. But we will have to qualify that a bit. Um, firstly, that it's ongoing, so that in classical political theory, the state of nature is being left into the state of law, right? Um, and, but this is, in custom international law, it's different because custom international law, because the formation is ongoing, constantly reproduces the state of nature. So I'm having a second graph here with two arrows now. So we have the doctrine of custom international law formation in the state of law, and it constantly reproduces the state of nature, and then it we get a, a state of law produced from that, and that is kind of an ongoing uh, process. And uh, things that's really ongoing, I think an even better picture would be this one, where the state of nature is kind of behind the state of law. So this is kind of emphasizing the paradoxical constellation here, that they're actually overlapping. Um, Right, which is of course not possible because uh, you can only have one at a time. But the, this is a paradoxical formulation of the doctrine of customary international law, which exactly evokes this image. And second qualification, since it's not the entirety of international law which is being suspended all the time, um, but only few norms or individual norms, I propose this, which you know we can't see anymore. So there are small black dots in this gray area. Mm -hmm. So I have now kind of merged these three images together, and you can see that there's a plane of international law with black dots uh, in there, which signifies the suspension of individual norms over which there are processes of customary international law formation. Now, I think my time is over. Um, let me just say two more sent sentences. Um, looking at it from the outside, 
Karlschmidt, I think, conceptualized exactly this kind of um, theory of international of law in general, and um, he conceptualized a sovereign which was entirely unbound. And this is one way, I think, of theorizing this relationship of law and its own side, so to speak. But um, if we look at the system theory of Niklas Luhmann, for example, um, and this is also kind of hinted at already in the theory of Karl Schmidt, I think, who says that the sovereignty is a borderline concept. And um, so we can see from Niklas Luhmann that actually this state of nature is itself a production of international law. So we must let go of this idea that there is an outside of international law, but the outside of international law is always within international law. So we have to remember that the doctrine of cosmic international law formation doesn't deal with something which is necessarily there, but we have the ability to come up with different concepts in international law, which are more reflective of the relation of inside and outside than this foundational kind of concept. Right, okay, I'm, I'm skipping the takeaway because there's just summary and um, thank you very much.